Oh my God, I did not think I was going to be able to record today because my software was all messed up and I had to restart my computer and I didn't know how long that was going to take. But we are here, we are finally recording and what is going on everybody? Welcome back to episode number 139 of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host James Murphy aka Murph. Hopefully you had a fantastic weekend. The weather, gorgeous. The Celtics, which we will talk about fantastic uh the patriots yet to be determined the bruins struggling red sox let's not talk about it but yes today is monday april 25th today is episode number 139 of the podcast and before we get into today's topics which again we'll be covering the celtics reacting to game three and obviously looking ahead to game four which is tonight in brooklyn we're also going to talk about the patriots and just dive into into their draft needs where we could see them taking certain players probably throughout the first few rounds. I mean, when you get to five, six, seven, it gets really difficult to kind of project that. So we're just going to kind of focus on maybe the first two, three rounds or so. But we really, I really want to dive into and have a conversation about that. But before we get into any of that, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to get to today. Just a little bit of housekeeping won't take up too much of our time today. Number one, I will be going live tonight on YouTube at 8 o'clock as I am going to be breaking uh, tons, I think 10 boxes of basketball cards for a basketball break through Murph's Card Town and Sports Shop. So if you're into that or if you have nothing to do tonight, definitely go check out the YouTube channel and watch the live stream. You can watch both the live stream and the Celtics all at the same time. It's going to be really fun. I know, poor planning on my part. But it's Monday, the shop is closed Tuesday, so it just made a lot of sense. I plan on going live in the future, probably on Monday nights. Number two, the Patriots draft, or just the draft special in general, is going to cover episode number 140 of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. So I will be going live on Thursday night for the draft. I will be live all the way up until after the Patriots make their selection at 21 bearing any trades forward or trade backs if they trade out of the first round and they're not selecting on thursday night then once that news breaks we'll wrap it up right then and there but that'll be very depressing but nonetheless i am looking forward to the draft live stream special i really hope you do tune into that again that will replace friday's episode of merv's boston sports talk so you'll be able to catch episode number 140 on monday may 2nd So again, 140 will be on May 2nd as there will be no episode this Friday as the draft live stream special will be essentially covering that. So again, I'll be going live tonight at 8 o'clock for a basketball break. I will be going live on Thursday for the NFL draft. There will be no episode on Friday the 29th as episode number 140 is going to be released on Monday, May 2nd. So I believe that's all the housekeeping that's on my agenda, if I believe. Just trying to run through my head real quick. Uh, Yeah, I believe that is all. So let's just dive into what we want to talk about, and that's the Boston Celtics. And we're going to be talking Celtics Patriots today. Bruins, their playoff, yes, is coming up. So we will be talking about that as we get closer and closer and closer to the playoffs. Probably once the matchups are all set, we can talk about a playoff preview between whoever they're playing against. Red Sox, long season. It's going to be really tough to talk a lot about the Red Sox right now, all things considered. Last year, Celtics and the Bruins took up so much of the podcast episode. Patriots in the draft, obviously post-draft. That's going to take up a lot of time too. So we will be mixing in the Red Sox here and there throughout the spring up until whenever the NBA and the NHL playoffs end for both the Celtics and the Bruins, respectively. Because the Patriots chatter will be fizzling out fairly soon up until around training camp. But right now, right now we have the Celtics to look at and talk about. Game 3, the Celtics won 109-103 on Saturday in Brooklyn to take a commanding 3-0 series lead. And it is very, very exciting it feels good to be a Celtics fan right now 
This series was projected to be a close six, seven game series. People had Brooklyn, people had Boston winning this series. And to be up three nothing right now, it feels good. You can't take your foot off the gas yet. You can't breathe just yet. Get by the first round and then breathe, then relax, recharge, restart, okay? Now is not the time to do it. You have game four tonight. You can finish them tonight in Brooklyn, their home their home court, and that is exactly what you should be doing, and that's exactly what your focus should be. I mean, why would you want to give Brooklyn any sense of life at all in this series? KD clearly is playing injured. Kyrie looked good game one, yes, but since then he has looked terrible, and the hatred that he's getting from Celtics fans is getting to him, clearly is getting to him. Ben Simmons expected to play today or in game four. Now he's not. I mean, he's a lifeless bum. So it's like nothing is going right for the Brooklyn Nets. I said this on Friday, and I'll say it again. Game one, they started off slow, and they came back and lost. Game two, they started off hot. Then they cooled down and lost. Game three, again, they started off hot. They sizzled out and it was a back and forth game until the Celtics took over and won. This series, in these first three games, all three games have gone differently for both teams. Whether it's starting off cold, starting hot, going back and forth, this series has been all over the place. It hasn't been commanding Celtics all three games. It hasn't been commanding Brooklyn all three games. Literally, the Celtics have started off hot, then they cooled down, but they still won. The Nets start in game two. The Nets started off hot, then they cooled down. Celtics ended up winning. Nets in game three started off hot, but then they sizzled out a little bit and it went back and forth the majority of the game. And then the Celtics ended up winning. So this series has literally taken many turns and looked very differently in all three games, but yet the Celtics have been able to come out on top. And the Brooklyn Nets haven't been able to scrape not one win out of those first three games, which all three games were easily, I don't want to say easily, but they were all winnable for them, especially game one. And how would this series look if they did win game one? Could I still see the Celtics even up 2-1 right now going into game four? Yes. Could I see Brooklyn up 2-1 going into game four? Yes. Could I see them up 3-0 going into game four? You know, maybe it's possible because I really do think the Celtics winning that game took the life out of Brooklyn. Kyrie drops near 40 points, and they're all hating on him, and he has to do it again in Game 2? He's a fragile, he has a fragile mind. His mental state is very fragile, and the Celtics fan base is clearly getting to him. And I think media personnel are starting to get to him as well. Kevin Durant, he's not the same Kevin Durant. I said this on Friday. He's clearly playing injured in some capacity. He really is. And I know Kevin Durant, arguably one of the best scorers of all time, if not the best scorer of all time, arguably one of the greatest players of all time, but he's 33 years old. I said this months ago when he got that calf strain, I think it was the do and, um, oh, what was he? He was in a, um, on YouTube, he was in a top five players to avoid video. I forget when I made it. It was either February or March. I want to say it was March, but don't quote me on that. And after he got that injury, I think it was February, I said, Kevin Durant is a top one of the top five players to avoid right now in sports cards because 33 years old, another injury, he has an injury history, the Nets look like they're in a debacle mess right now, avoid Kevin Durant cards. And I know that this podcast isn't necessarily about sports cards or whatnot, but I'm sure a lot of you listeners, whether... Uh, listen to my other YouTube video, or watch my other YouTube videos, or are invested into sports cards in one way or another. But what I said months ago is coming to fruition now. And it's clearly evident. Kevin Durant is getting locked up. He's not getting easy shots off. He's not getting easy shots. He's not getting easy looks at all. Whether it's Tatum, Brown, Smart. I mean, Al Horford has guarded him sometimes. He's not getting anything easy at all in this series. Yes, Kevin Durant looks great when he plays against a 15-20 win club, okay? 
I, I think it's pretty easy for a really good player to look good against a 15-20 win basketball team. But when you're playing up against the Celtics, who won 51 games, I guess if you want to include these three, 54 now, and you have Tatum, Brown, Smart, Al Horford, all who play great defense, Rob Williams is now back, it's going to be very tough, especially at 33 when you have the whole situation with Kyrie going on. You had the whole situation with James Harden going on. Now he's gone, and now you have Ben Simmons. Now you're going through that whole situation with Ben freaking Simmons. I think it's starting to catch up to to Kevin Durant emotionally and mentally in his own right. And he doesn't have the whole mental fiasco that Kyrie Irving has. So I I don't want to say that this is that game four is a formality for the Celtics because it may appear that way, especially when you're up three nothing. But I don't want to take this game for granted because if you just give Brooklyn one win, especially on their home court, it just juices them up with a little bit of life. And at this point, they have nothing to lose. They have absolutely nothing to lose. Just Let's just go balls to the walls. All it takes is one. That's it. Just one game. And I don't want to give them that one game. You have them up against the wall. You have your foot on their neck. Finish the job. Don't bring this series back to Boston. No way should this series come back to Boston. But if it does, then we're going to have a completely different conversation. Obviously, we're not going to have a chance to talk about it here on the podcast, nor are we going to have a chance to talk about Game 6 or even Game 7. But I want to really just focus right now on Game 4. I've been saying this this entire series. Focus on Game 1. Just focus on Game 2. Just focus on Game 3. Now, just focus on Game 4. Do not look ahead to Game 5, 6, or 7. I don't care. All I care about is 7 p.m. tip-off, Celtics, Nets. That's all I care about. Win that game. You have been up, and you've lost a lead, and you still won. You've been down. You fought back, and you still won. You've been in back-and-forth games, and you still won. You've won in every sort of fashion this series so far. I don't see an excuse where the Celtics lose tonight. Like, oh, they just didn't look good. They didn't pass the ball tonight. They didn't play good defense. Mm -mm. They've done everything right for the first three games of the series. There's no excuse for them not to do something right tonight. I don't think there's an excuse. The Celtics are clearly the better team. They have the better players, the better bench, the better coaching staff, the better defense, obviously the better offense right now. And they just got back Rob Williams the other day, who was on a minutes restriction. Today, I think that minutes restriction has increased, but I still believe he is on a restriction nonetheless. And Game 4 was supposed to be the arrival of Ben Simmons for the Brooklyn Nets, but yet again, he woke up yesterday with back pain oh muffin back pain oh you poor thing listen we all have back pain bro we all do hold on let me how old is ben simmons real quick ben simmons dude he's 25 i'm 25 and i have back pain too and like i understand i'm not a professional basketball player or anything close to that i understand that But I think anybody above the age of 20 probably has back pain to some degree. Obviously, older folks will have more back pain and they can relate more. And there's absolutely no excuse for us us younger folks to have back pain. But come on, dude. Your team is on the brink of elimination. They traded a, a, a really good player in James Harden to bring you in. Yeah, they got draft picks, and that was probably the majority of, you know, the haul was the draft picks. Yeah, they got Seth Curry, you know, he's a great shooter. But Ben Simmons was a major part of that trade. Okay, you needed some time to get back into shape. I get it. I get it. But, dude, come on. I made a video. Oh, when was it? I forget. I think it was in December. Ben Simmons has gone broke video. And it has, like, I think, like, over 500 views now on YouTube. And, oh, my God, it's so funny. I just spent, like, 10 minutes just ripping them a new one. And I would strongly recommend go checking that out because it's it's still all relatable to right now. It's still all relatable right now. I just do not understand. 
You have no competitive drive. You have no will to play the game of basketball. You're literally, you robbed the 76ers. Now you're robbing the Brooklyn Nets of a paycheck. It's unbelievable what this dude has done this year. He sat out because he wanted to trade. He then filed a grievance against the 76ers, even though he chose not to play. And now with the Nets, he was going to play, but he needs to rehab. So he is still collecting those checks because he's rehabbing. But, oh, my God, this dude is just pathetic. And people were trying to tell me. People were trying to tell me that Ben Simmons was better than Jason Tatum, probably like last year. People are trying to tell me that Ben Simmons is a top 25 player in this league. No. No. This dude could get on the court tonight completely healthy, and he'll look like ass against the Celtics. Because whoever would be guarding him would absolutely lock him down. Because he can't shoot. He has no jump shot, no mid-range game. He's nice around the rim. You know, 6 whatever. What is he, six? 11 around the rim fun layups dunks sure that's great good defender good passer but i mean this dude just is a straight bum he quit on the 76ers he has now quit on the brooklyn nets oh my god this dude has turned into a bust i'm sorry he has turned into a bust former first overall pick in 2016 he is officially officially in my opinion a bust the Brooklyn Nets need him they gave up James Harden I know that situation wasn't going all peaches and roses with James Harden and the Brooklyn Nets you still traded him and got Ben Simmons back so you were hoping that Ben Simmons could replace James Harden in some capacity instead you're getting absolutely nothing whereas the 76ers are are they up currently three games to one Against the Raptors, I haven't checked their situation. Uh, let's see, what are they up right now? I, yeah, three games to one. Oh, and they play game five tonight. So, yeah. <laughs> I know this kind of just t took a turn for me ranting on Ben Simmons, and I didn't mean it to. But, yes, Celtics, just focus on tonight. Play the defense at, you know, a thousand percent like you have been all series. And then once you wrap it up tonight, if you do, you will have almost uh, almost a week or so to kind of just like rest and relax. I don't know when game uh, series two starts or the conference semifinals. I don't know when that starts. But I mean, if you wrap it up tonight, you can rest and relax. Yes, Tatum is young. Uh, Brown is young. Smart, eh, he's fairly young, but he's obviously older. Al Horford is older. Rob Williams just came back from injury. So regardless if these guys are young or not, could use the time to rest and relax and just kind of just take a breather and just prepare yourself for whoever you're going to face in the following round. And I really do like the Celtics' chances to close it out tonight. I just don't see the Nets having any will to fight in this game. Could we see the Celtics blow them out because the Nets just are playing this game for formality purposes? Yes. Absolutely. And if that happens, Kyrie Irving's going to get slammed. Kevin Durant's going to get slammed. Ben Simmons is and will get slammed for just the scrutiny that is ahead of them and the fact that they gave up on their team. And I can't wait for it. I am looking forward to it immensely. Immensely. So prediction, I am looking forward to the Celtics hopefully closing this series out. I do think they can do it. Could I see them still lose this game? Yes, I do not think it'll happen. Three things. I guess I'll give you three things that I want to see in this game is obviously an increased uh, usage of Rob Williams, the Time Lord, whether it's going from 20 minutes to 25, 30, or just him being more of a presence on the glass or defensively, whatever that may be. I just want to see him have more of a presence. He had two points and two rebounds in his series debut in his first game since surgery, which I believe was on March 30th or 31st, I believe they were saying. So I don't want to see I don't want to see him play 40 something minutes. I don't want to see him, you know, overextending himself. I just want to see, you know, six, eight points, 
10 rebounds, something like that, or eight rebounds, you know, just, just take that next step. That's what I'm looking for. Number two, number two, I'd like to see the Celtics get to an early lead, an early double digit lead if they can, especially if they can get to one in the first quarter. I really think it's just going to really suck the wind right out of Brooklyn because if Brooklyn was to get a lead early, then they might be able to coast to a game four victory and just, hey, we'll see what happens game five, right? But if you can kind of bury them early and really give them no light at the end of the tunnel and you can really just take their soul right out of the team, then they're just going to fold and you may, you may end up winning by 30 because they're just going to check out. So I want to see the Celtics get ahead early in this game, double-digit lead, first quarter, early second quarter, just really, really do your best to just take all the heart and soul out of the Brooklyn Nets out, especially from the fan base who's attending game four. Number three, defense. I want to see that defense remain a focal point for the Celtics. Defense turns into offense, shut down the Brooklyn Nets offense, and turn that defense into your offense where hopefully you can kind of circle back to point two and get a double-digit lead and take control through offense. But it's all going to start with defense, 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 which has been the primary focus for the Celtics so far in this series, and it has been their defense. And I strongly do believe, despite the great play we're getting from multiple Celtics players, I do believe it is all revolving back to the great defensive play from the Boston Celtics. So those are the three things that I'm looking forward to in Game 4 for the Boston Celtics against the Brooklyn Nets. Game 4 is tonight in Brooklyn. Tip-off at 7 p.m. between your Boston Celtics and the Brooklyn Nets. What are your thoughts about this series? Do you think the Nets have any chance to win tonight? Do you think they have a chance to win a couple games in the series? Do you think they even have a chance to come back at all? What are you looking forward to from the Boston Celtics, Brooklyn Nets game four, or even the remainder of this series. I would love to hear all about it in the comment section below down here on YouTube, or if you're listening on audio only platforms, reach out to me via social media at Murph's Car Town. I would love to indulge in a conversation with you one way or the other, as I'm really looking forward to just talking more and more Celtics basketball, because obviously they are clearly in the middle of a playoff series. And it is a fantastic time to talk Celtics, Celtics, Celtics. With that being said, let us let me get a sip of water. Let me get a sip of water first. All right. Ah, that was delicious water. Let's talk about the New England Patriots. We have so many holes to fill. We have... So many needs on this team. And how many do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven draft picks. A little bit of maneuverability. A little bit of maneuverability. But then again, not as much as in years past, maybe. So what are the Celtics going to do? Well, I want to start by reading an article from the sportingnews.com. And it's written by Jacob Kamenker. Kamenker? I know I'm saying that wrong. Cam and Kerr, sure. It is t- he released this six hours ago, so he was up late. Uh, titled, Pages Draft Picks 2022. When does New England pick? Full list of NBA or NFL draft selections. Excuse me. The article would go on to say, The Patriots didn't endure much of a lull in the post-Tom Brady era. They missed the playoffs in 2020, but managed to make it back with Mac Jones in 2021. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> Of course, they still weren't able to win a playoff game. The Bills schooled them in a wild card round of the postseason, winning 47-17 in a contest that was never particularly close. Patriots owner Robert Kraft isn't happy that the team hasn't won a playoff game over the last three years, so the 2022 NFL season will be a big one for the Patriots. Now, there has been rumors and reports that Bill Belichick could be on his way out if they don't win a playoff game this year, but that's a whole nother can of worms for a completely other day. Uh, continuing with the article. New England wasn't very active in free agency during the 2022 offseason. The team lost a handful of players, including J.C. Jackson, while adding a few free agents on short-term cheap deals. They also traded for Devontae Parker and Mac Wilson, 
which should help them at receiver and linebacker, respectively. Still, if the Patriots want to take a step forward in the loaded AFC, they will have to nail the NFL draft just like they did in 2021. If they can find another Jones slash Christian Barmore type combination, that will go a long way towards improving this team. Here's a look at the Patriots picks in the 2022 NFL draft. Round 1, pick 21. Round 2, pick 54. Round 3, pick 85. Round 4, pick 127. Round 5, pick 170. Round 6, pick 200. Round 6, pick 210. And then the fifth round, 170 overall, is from Tampa Bay, that Shaq Mason trade. And then the sixth round pick, overall 210, is from the Los Angeles Rams, which I'm not sure what that one's from. I'm trying to just do some quick math in my head. Oh, the Sony Michelle trade. There we go. Sony Michelle trade. Patriots NFL draft needs cornerback. The Patriots let JC Jackson walk during free agency, and they have questions about their number one cornerback as a result. The team added Malcolm Butler and Terrace Mitchell to join what looks like a room with good depth, but they still need a true shutdown option on the outside. Linebacker. Kyle Van Noy and Dante Hightower are gone. So is Jamie Collins. The Patriots have some quality role players at linebacker, but they need a true three-down playmaker at the position. Utah's Devin Lloyd should interest them if he's available in the first round of the 2022 NFL Draft. Defensive end. Matt Judon proved to be a massive upgrade for the Patriots on the edge and for like the first 12 weeks. However, they still aren't very strong across from him. Maybe Josh Uche or Ronnie Perkins will break out, but adding more pass rush depth would be a smart move. Guard. The Patriots lost both of their starting guards from the 2022, uh, I'm sorry, guards from 2021 during the offseason as Ted Karras signed with the Bengals while Shaq Mason was traded to the Buccaneers. Uh, Michael Onwenu will take over at one of the vacated spots, but New England needs a potential starter at the other position. They have had success finding steals like Mason and Onwenu in, uh, late in the draft before. Wide receiver. The Patriots need a receiver isn't a glaring, isn't as glaring after they traded for Devontae Parker, but they should still have an interest in adding another potential pack pass catcher with Nikhil Harry pick looking like a failure. There are plenty of talented mid-rounder receivers that New England can target. And this, um, then he added a mock draft for the Patriots according to Vinny Iyer's seven-round mock draft. And he has the Patriots in the first round, pick 21, taking Jamison Williams, wide receiver from Alabama. Second round, pick 54, Logan Hall, the edge rusher from Houston. Uh, round three, pick 85, uh, Damone Clark, the linebacker from LSU. Round four, pick 127, Joshua Williams, the cornerback out of uh, Fayetteville State. Pick five, I'm sorry, round five, pick 170, Chris Paul, guard, LOL, uh, from Tulsa. Not the point guard, Chris Paul, guys. I mean, it was a joke. Uh, round six, pick 200, DJ Dale, the defensive tackle from Alabama. And round six, pick 210, Amari Barno, edge rusher from Virginia Tech. And to be honest, guys, I absolutely hate this mock draft. I just wanted to read it to you to give you guys a lot of depth and a lot of information about the Patriots ahead of Thursday. Actually, ahead of Thursday in the weekend's draft because it's a three-day event. I absolutely hate hate this little mock draft from Vinny Ayers, uh seven-round mock draft. Absolutely hate it. I think it's – I it addresses the needs, yes. It addresses needs, but not where I'd like to see them go. I've been a huge advocate for Jamison Williams coming to the Patriots at 21. If he's available at 21, you take him. I don't care if um, Devin Lloyd is on the board. I don't care if Nicobe Dean or Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt, who's projected to go later in the first round now. I don't care who's on the board. I don't care if you traded for Devontae Parker. You take Jamison Williams there. I talked about this on Friday, guys. Devontae Parker... Is nice. A little injury prone, but he has number one potential. You have Kendrick Bourne, and you have Jacoby Myers. You have Nelson Aguilar, and you currently have uh, Nikhil Harry. Great. Nikhil Harry's probably out the door. After the end of this coming season, Nelson Aguilar is probably out the door. And at the end of this season, Jacoby Myers isn't going to get re-signed, so he's going to be out the door. 
So you're going to have Devontae Parker starting next year with one year left. And then you're going to have Kendrick Bourne. And that's it. You need to bring in Jamison Williams, not just for depth, not just because of his skill set, but looking ahead at the future. Bringing in Jamison Williams, if he wasn't injured, is a top 10 projected pick or was a top 10 projected pick. He looks like he's going to be back around October now or maybe even September. So I don't expect him to be left on the board at 21, but I absolutely could see it because some teams just, you know, wide receivers, ACLs, they just want nothing to do with it. Okay? But if he's there, you take him. You can get a linebacker. You can get an edge or a corner or a guard anywhere else in this draft. Yes, I know wide receiver is the deepest draft, uh, the deepest position in the draft. I understand that. But a top 10 talent at 21 is so hard to pass up on. So hard to pass up on. He will not be there come that second round, obviously. He may not even be there come your pick in the first round, but if he is, you take him. So now let's talk about if he is gone. Where should the Patriots go? If Jamison Williams is gone, I don't want them to take a, a wide receiver in that first round. I'd like to see them take a N'Kobe Dean or a Devin Lloyd, one of those linebackers from Georgia or Utah, respectively. I think that'd be a really good spot if they can grab one of those linebackers there. If neither of them are there, I don't want them to reach. Absolutely do not want them to reach at all. What else could we see them take in that spot if Williams... Devin Lloyd or Nicobe Dean are all taken. Well, could you go with a guard there in like a Kenyon Green or a, a tackle guard in Tyler Smith? Sure. Would a George Karlaftis, the edge rusher from Purdue fit? Yeah, but I, I don't really, not a fan of him, to be honest. He's been projected all over the place. End of the top 10, early teens, out of the first round. I just don't know how I feel about him. I think he's a little all over the place. Could we see a Trent McDuffie from the cornerback from Washington fall? I have him projected going to the Ravens at 14 in my mock draft 3.0, which I will talk about in the live stream. I'll also release on social media, but I'll talk about it in the live stream on Thursday. But we could see someone like him fall a little bit. Could we see the Patriots go for a... Andrew Booth, the cornerback out of uh, Clemson at 21 to fill that void? Yes. What about Kair Elam, the cornerback out of Florida? Could we see them? Could we see him be taken at 21? Yes. Not a fan of Elam at 21. I think Booth at 21 is a stretch, but I wouldn't hate it. What about a Lewis Seen, the, the safety out of Georgia? What about Daxton Hill, the safety out of Michigan? What about one of those two guys at 21? How would we feel about that, replacing a Devin McCourty uh, long-term? That's not terrible. I mean, I know you got Jabril Peppers. I know you got Kyle Duggar. You have Devin McCourty this year. Uh, Adrian Phillips. So bringing in another safety seems like a stretch, but when you look at it long-term, uh, is Jabril Peppers going to be here next year? Maybe, maybe not. Devin McCourty, probably not. So we could see the Patriots go in that direction, although it is not a position of need. The second round is probably one of the most interesting spots for the Patriots as they're little, not exactly in the middle, but just about in the middle of that second round. As we could see them, let's see, 32, so yeah, 21 picks away. So yeah, that's their pick. Could we see them go after uh, a Kair Elam, the cornerback out of Florida, if they don't take one in the first round? Yes, I think that's a great spot for him. I would expect him to go sooner than that, but hey, you never know. Uh, John Mechie, if you don't take Jamison Williams in the first round, slash he's not available in the first round, I'd like to see John Mechie right there in that spot. That'd be a great spot for him and the Patriots. I know he's projected to go somewhere in day two, second to third round. I do not see him falling in the third round. I don't think he'll be there in the third round for when the Patriots pick at 85. I just don't see that happening. I know wide receivers are deep, but I think teams are going to take good wide receivers early just because it's a passing league you need weapons for your young quarterbacks or for the future so I think someone like a Christian Watson's Jahan Dotson uh, Traylon Burks and uh, a John Mechie and I can go on and on Sky Moore they could all get taken that early second round maybe some of them in the late first but I see a bunch of those guys 
getting taken in that second round because a lot of teams are going to see in here, oh, deep wide receiver class. All right, we'll take what our major need is in the first and we'll take one of those wide receivers in the second and fill everything out um, from third through seventh round. Uh, what else could I see the Patriots doing? I don't really like the edge rusher rushing pick in the second round, though. I'd rather see something like that get addressed in the fourth or the fifth round, maybe. But besides John Mechie, besides Kair Elam, I could see a, a Lewis uh, scene fall, excuse me, a fall to the second round, pick 54 especially. I could see the Patriots going after a linebacker with that pick. It's all just going to depend on what they do with that first round pick. I do see a combination of wide receiver, uh, linebacker, and cornerback in some capacity in the first three rounds. Specifically the first two rounds. I do see the Patriots taking wide receiver, corner, and or linebacker with their first two picks. And then more than likely, whatever pick is whatever position is left probably going in that third round and I would be totally okay with that as long as the wide receiver is addressed within the first two picks so if you take a wide receiver in the first then take a linebacker or a corner in the second and then on the other in the third if you take a linebacker in the first take the wide receiver in the second then take the corner in the third just do not let the wide receiver be a third round pick because yes it's deep but I see a ton of of wide receivers flying in the second round. I really do. Could we see a Christian Watch and Traylon Burke uh, fall in the second round? Yes, and they will be taken early in the second round. Jahan Dotson, I already mentioned John Mechie, Sky Moore. These guys could go in the first. They could fall out of the first into the second round. And I do see teams jumping on those players who have first-round talent, who have first-round potential being taken in the second round when their team does come up so you have to play it strategically you have to anticipate wide receivers flying that's why if Jamison Williams is there at 21 you take him and forget about your wide receiver need because this year this coming year you will be okay Devontae Parker um, Jacoby Myers Kendrick Bourne yeah Nelson Aguilar yeah Nikhil Harry like you'll be okay plus you have Hunter Henry Jonu Smith James White you'll be okay Jamison Williams is a long-term play. He's a long-term play. I'd like to see the Patriots take a guard around that fourth or fifth spot in the draft, the fourth or fifth round in the draft. I don't really know exactly who. I haven't really done my research in terms of who they should take in the fourth. Who should? Da, da, da. Like I just kind of focus like on the top 90 picks or so. Uh, I guess 96. You know, 32 times three. Yeah, 96. Um, I really want to see the Patriots address their edge, like I mentioned, not in the second round, but I could definitely see them doing it later in the draft. Trey Flowers was a fourth-round pick before, so you could definitely take him, uh, take an edge rusher in the fourth. You can even bring Trey Flowers back, in all honesty. I mean, he's still a free agent. Uh, defensive tackle, I guess, could be addressed more as a depth position. If a DJ Dale is there in the sixth round, like he is projected in Vinny Iyer's seven-round mock draft, sure, take him. I know a lot of people like Slade Bolden, the uh, wide receiver out of Alabama. I mean, he's a small, quick white guy. That a lot of people think he's like the next Edelman or the next Wes Welker or Danny Amendola. So, like, him in the seventh round. I know you don't have a seventh round pick, but, like, him in the late sixth, seventh round, you know, obviously I'm expecting the Patriots to probably trade back at some point. Take him. I think that would be a really good depth filler. Plus, it could be someone that Mac Jones – can really bond to because they were teammates at Alabama, as was John Mechie. Jamison Williams and Mac Jones were not. But still, Alabama runs deep. So there's a lot of avenues the Patriots can go down in the 2022 NFL Draft. And I really want to try to cover a lot of it. I really want to focus on the Patriots, specifically in this episode, instead of talking about you know my Mock Draft 3.0, which I will release at some point soon and i'll definitely be breaking it down more and more on the nfl draft live stream that will be thursday at uh when's the draft start eight o'clock nfl draft 2022 i'm assuming it starts at eight o'clock oh uh, let's see let's see let's see they're not gonna tell me start time 
Uh, 8 p.m. on Thursday. Yeah, so, you know, once the draft turns on and the Jaguars get on the clock, then I'll really be breaking down my mock draft 3.0. But, again, that is going to do it for me and everything that I need to talk about in terms of the Patriots and their 2022 NFL draft outlook, needs, breakdown. I really tried to fly through a lot of information fast, so I really hope you were able to take in as much as you can. What are your thoughts, though? I mean, you know mine. You know where I'm at. You know how I feel about this. But where are you at? What do you feel about the NFL draft, specifically about the Patriots? Who? What do you want them to do with 21? Take a linebacker. Take a receiver. Take something else. Trade up. Trade down. Let me know in the comment section below if you're listening to this on YouTube or reach out to me via social media at Murph's Car Town because I want to know. Do I have the right outlook here for the Patriots? Am I missing something? Or am I just being negligent of an obvious team need that maybe I didn't talk about? Fill me in, guys. Have a conversation because I really want to dive into the 2022 NFL Draft because I love draft season. I really do. And I really can't wait to share that with you on Thursday at 8 o'clock. I'm super, super excited. Again, a couple housekeeping notes. I'll be going live tonight on YouTube for a basketball break at 8 o'clock. The NFL Draft live stream will be at 8 o'clock on Thursday. Episode number 140 will not be on Friday as it will be on Monday because the draft special will be kind of taking that spot. But that is going to wrap it up for today's episode. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and enjoying episode number 139 of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I really appreciate all the love and support from everybody downloading, listening, and enjoying this podcast. As I greatly appreciate it, I get tons of compliments from people about this podcast, and it's really humbling and really appreciative. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please make sure you like the video, comment down below like I've already asked, and please consider subscribing to the channel if you have not done so already. It's that giant red subscribe button. You can't miss it. Smash that as I would greatly appreciate the love and support as I'm on my way to 500 subscribers now that I'm past 250. That is going to do it for me. I hope you have a fantastic week. It's going to be some nice weather, I believe. Uh, Let me just double check here. I believe it's supposed to be fairly nice. Mid to upper 50s all week, it seems like. So Tuesday, going to be a little bit of rain, a little bit of rain today, but that's okay. Weekend looks good. The weekend looks good, but all right, folks. I will catch you in the next one, but between now and then, you guys know that I love you, and I will always, always see you.